we get started, thank you very much, Stu, for taking the time out of your trip and to us. talking to us. Um, we'll get straight into it. So, uh, what was your earliest BMX memory? Racing or just oh, BMX, just BMX, BMX in just general? So, how did it how did it enter your life? Being a kid, yeah. Uh, having my dad buy me a Schwinn Stingray in the probably uh, late '60s, early '70s. Um, strip off all the non-essential parts, chain guard. Take the banana seat, put a small 10 speed seat on it, um, get some mud and make a jump and, or a ramp and or jump off the curb. I think the first time I rode the bike, I had a real steep driveway and I just pushed off and off I went and I crashed in my neighbor's trash can. Because that's how I, that was my break. It was a trash can break. Um, but no, I, I learned how to ride bikes pretty quick and I don't know, I just emulated motocross racing. I like I liked watching motocross riders, you know. European guys. Um, there's probably a bunch of them out there, but the only one I can remember is like Roger DeCoster. He was one of my heroes growing up. So I always emulated, you know, motorcycle racing. So bobbing wheelies, see how many times I can ride wheelies around the block, and um, go to local high school where I where I ended up going to high school, and it would be a big field jumps, and we would go jump, you know, just build jumps, and just emulate motocross racing. I used to hang out at a motorcycle shop that was just around the corner from my house and I'd go and buy two pairs of grips because the right side was for a throttle which is too big for the for the handlebars. So I'd have to buy two pair and then throw away the rights and then I'd sli you know, slide both lefts on and, and I'd hang out there and just have fun. I'd wash their bikes, earn a couple bucks and then um, I found this flyer one day up on the cork board at the register and it said uh, you know bums bmx racing and i'm like what the heck is that and it had a you know a bunch of hand drawing of some kids riding bikes and stuff so i'm like yeah, that's pretty cool but i'm thinking that's in long beach and i live in uh i was living in whittier at the time so it's kind of a driving distance and i didn't have a driver's license so uh, i talked to my friend we both hung out at the motorcycle shop his name was walt and um we talked his dad into throwing the bikes in the back of his camper van, and uh, he took us to Bones. And uh, I signed up. I didn't know what I was doing. There was a bunch of all these guys with all these really cool bikes, and I just had a green or gold Schwinn Stingray with you know big handlebars, and you know, we didn't have to wear helmets. So I just had a, a little paper paper hat that I picked up from the paint store. Um, that was kind of our riding style. I always always wore a, a painter's cap when I rode the local trails by my house. But, you know, we did a lot of trail riding prior to that. So I really knew how to handle the bike, so it wasn't a big deal. And then uh, I got there and, and went through all the, the uh, qualifying stuff and then I ended up getting like fifth place. Um, that was kind of cool, it was fun. And then uh, I went to talk to Scott and asked him about, you know, when are some of the other races and what's the schedule. And I saw a, a trophy over on the table and I said, you know, hey, does that belong to anybody? And he goes, well, no. And I says, well, can I get a fifth place trophy? And he goes, ah, here, go ahead, have it to me. So I got a fifth place trophy, and even though the gate trophy is only third place, so I came out a winner. <laughs> <laughs> but that was fun. I had a good time, and, and we ended up coming back, and we raced there a few times. I, I don't remember exactly how many times, but we raced there a few times, and then after the races, there was a, an elementary school across the street and they had like uh, like a little painted serpentine, you know, like a little trail, like the kids would exercise and they would have to walk around. And but what we would do is we'd take our bikes and we would un unloosen the gooseneck and then take the bars and move them all the way down to almost as far as they would go by, by the front wheel. And we would um, emulate like cafe racing on the, on the pavement and stay within the lines. We did that. That was a lot of fun too. That was after those races. <laughs> then we would all meet up and, and just go to different jumping spots. Um, and then we lived in the Orange County, and so we did a lot of racing in Orange County. But there was always a there was a, a faction of riders that were up in, in the northern part of Los Angeles County and, and the Valley, and they were always just they raced, we raced, but we never really intermingled so much. So. Uh, it took a while before we started kind of, they would come to us and we would go to them and then there would be like the, the Orange County, LA County rivalry and it was kind of fun, you know. 
raced in the double local races. And it's just, it just, you know, one day turned to the next day, to the week, to the month, to the year, to the decade, to where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> um, can we talk a little bit about those tracks from back in the early days? Like, um, we hear a lot about bums, but no one really describes what it was like. Were there jumps? Were there puddles? Were there berms? Were there exactly there were <laughs> all of those. There there were bumps. There were, I mean, when you say jump, I mean, I mean, there's some documented photos floating around on the websites um, of bums. Um, I would say the the trail or tracks were very primitive, very rough. Uh, went from a, a ready set go little hill down to a, a cow trail really quick, not a whole lot of passing, uh, a lot of elbowing, a lot of kicking, a lot of pushing people off berms and stuff. But, you know, the, the jumps would maybe be two, three feet high with no backside, just a flat landing into a flat turn, maybe dig a hole, throw it full of water, either right through it or go over it. Um, a lot of sand, a lot of loose gravel, junk, dirt, rocks, just you know, BMX. There are a lot of uh, downhill tracks too, really sort of rough, gnarly downhill tracks as well. Yeah, there was uh, Randall Ranch was one that was in the valley. Um, we had Saddleback, uh, Yarnell was one of the first ones that I ever went to in the valley. Um, I felt like I was driving 600 miles just to get to this one downhill track. It took us forever to get there, but that was a really cool fast track. And they had an old Yarnell and a new Yarnell, and the, the year I went there, the old Yarnell was just had just closed down. But we rode the old we rode the old Yarnell. It basically followed the power line, uh, the big power line towers, and it was basically just down the fire road, and they and they had just these huge mounds of dirt where you would. It seemed like you were flying 50 feet, you know, in the air, and we rode that. It was really windy that day, so I got kind of spooked. So I rode a little bit, and then uh, and then what it did is it came back on to what is now the what was now going to be the new Yarnell and it serpentine, and it just went fast. And there's been a couple movies that have been you know little clips, 10 minute clips or something that NBA has put on. Um, you have to search for them on the internet. You can find them. It's kind of cool. But that was a really fun track. And then Saddleback. But Saddleback was kind of like, it started at a plateau. And you, you come down, you make a turn, you go down a hill, you hit a fire break, and then you just went straight down this hill. And if you went too fast, you, yeah, you can actually fly to the bottom. That was done a couple times. I'm um, not good on bikes, especially if it's like a Schwinn Stingray or something like that. But at that point in time, the bikes have started evolving, and there were, you know, there were Webcos and DGs and Red Lines, so there weren't, you know, BMX had started evolving into specialty bikes now. And then there was uh, like a one-time track at Escape Country for the Jimmy Weiner National. Um, there were some tracks in San Diego. I think Poway was a downhill track. Um, so not a lot of them, but you know, there were a few of them, but I think the most predominant ones were Yarnell and Saddleback. Those were your two big downhill tracks. Do you remember um, how big the crowds were back in those days? Mainly parents, family, and friends. Yeah, yeah they weren't they weren't crazy. Um, unless you went to like the Yamaha Gold Cup or something like that. But then again, it was still family and friends and friends of the family. You know, the crowd was a little bit bigger because you had this huge LA Coliseum, but they only limited where you could sit for that event just to a little a little cubicle. You know, but there are pictures, you know, of us racing inside the Coliseum, but it's with huge crowds all the way around. But that was a, a actually a halftime exhibition for the Los Angeles Rams football game. So there were, you know, eighty thousand people watching us, you know, at halftime jumping off the ramps, you know, going across the grass and then finishing. But the Yamaha Gold Cup was, you know, the fan, I mean, the, they always make, I call it movie magic, you know, they always, <laughs> always make it look like the crowd's huge, but, you know, they were, I, you know maybe there was a thousand people there, it could have been more, it could have been less, but it seemed like a lot. Um, talking about the Yamaha Gold Cup, um, how did you find out about it, and what was the experience like as a rider? You know, to be how did I find out about it? It was just one of those, because, being involved in the sport, uh, see that was 1974, so I had a couple years in 
um, just word of mouth. Um, Scott being the promoter, um, probably got a flyer from him, you know, come to this. And, and there were, there were um, what do I want to say, qualification races that you had to do to get to the main event. So I think there was five or six different venues that you had to win or place to actually get to the final event at the LA Coliseum. So, you know, you had, you, you had a lead up to it. So how, how I learned about it, it was a flyer, a word of mouth, I don't remember. I just remember that I, I had to, I, the first one I went to, I didn't qualify, so I went to one of the races in San Diego, and I qualified at that one, and then qualified for the, the finals at the LA Coliseum. So um, that would have been one of the bigger races that you went to. I think to. that was the, the <clears throat> biggest one that put me more on the mainstream. And I, I, to be honest with you, I got super lucky that day. You know, big crash on the first turn, or the first straightaway of the water jump, there was a big crash. If that crash wouldn't happen, I don't know if, if it, I would be sitting here today or whoever didn't crash, would they be sitting here today? Who knows? Fate was in my hands. Um, I still had to work my way up and I uh, got myself in a good position. We did two laps around the, the 440 track with all these little, it was probably like 14 million kilo tons of hay bales that we had to, you know, <laughs> go in and out. But watching, watching it on video, it's so cool to see me come down the back straight behind this guy and I just passed him like he was like something jammed in his back wheel or something. I'm like, holy <laughs> that fast that day, you know, and, and I did as fast as I'm going at the very end, I still didn't jump the whole water trough and it was only probably about 10 feet long and I still didn't make it because I was all like, keyed in going straight and I just wanted to win the race and I won the race and it was kind of cool, you know, I think that was the kind of the big push that I got to like, hey, you know, even though I got lucky, I still was strong enough to finish hard and fast and, you know, I did show some skill and stuff, so, and then just kind of progressed. So at that stage were you already sponsored? Yeah, we had a, I had a sponsor called Dirtmaster. Um, Bob Phillips was the, the, the owner of the company and basically all he did was have number plates, pads, some really hard rubber grips, um, fake plastic gas tanks, just bike accessories. That was, that was his company. And we got, we got bikes um, from Redline. Um, I started riding the Redline Squareback uh, while I was on Dirtmaster. And uh, rode on, I rode on that team for about a year and then started, and then that's when I started bouncing around. So from that team, did you go to FMF? No, I believe I went to Webco, but there could have been some other smaller independent like we made a joke about it earlier, I'd have to go to Wikipedia and <laughs> check myself. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even know. I, I, there's, there's people out there that know more about me than I know about myself. So um, I'll have to fact, fact check it. Uh, so you bounced around um, a couple of companies, obviously, uh, FMF. Yeah, I, went, you know, I, did, I did DG. Um, the timeline, there was like another company, it's like Newport Design, but I don't know if it was before or after DG. Could have been before because I know I went from DG to FMF because the D DG was a motorcycle uh, accessory company made all the motocross bikes for you know the accessories like swing arms and pipes and bars and stuff for like guys like Brock Glover, Bob Hanna they all you know they all rode like that and then FMF said hey you know let's let's get involved in this BMX stuff because DG's doing it so then um, I became more friends with Scott and Scott was heading going to be heading the FMF team, so he asked me to come over, and I said, yeah, sure, why not? So we went over to the FMF team, and then he told me that he had this passion to, to come up with a, another company called Scott Enterprises, which turned out to be SE Racing, and uh, we kind of used the format of the, the FMF bikes, but we retooled them and made them a little bit different and, and came out with um, the SE line of bikes, but they were still in production, and I didn't want to ride the FMF, so I started riding a mongoose. Uh, while I was on SC Racing, because we didn't have a bike yet. Um, so Scott wasn't that much older than you at the time, was he? No, he was a year older than me. And um, so what led to the 
famous or infamous STR being developed? Uh, well, I, I, I just uh, was in the hunt for the number one plate for, I got the NBA number one plate, so I was the number one rider for the National Bicycle Association, so I had that number plate, and then I was also vying for the ABA number one plate, so um, towards the end of the year, uh, Scott, you know, he was always in his office drawing and making and designing and, and fabricating and stuff, so he, he, he told me to come into his office and show me this bike that he was you know, with all these twin tubes and all these bends and a uh, very intricate frame and he wanted to call it the Stu Thompson bike, you know, or the STR1, Stu Thompson replica number one, because the number one had the, the, the twin tubes that came underneath the bottom bracket wrapped around and then reconnected just before the head tube. So it was like one tube with like six different bands. It was very hard to make and weld. So he built that, we rode it. Um, I, I won, I think, the first couple races that, that I went to. I think the first race I did was in, um, I think it was in Texas at maybe, I can't remember, the Summer National or Lone Star National or something. It was an indoor race and I brought it out for its debut and, and went away with the, the win. Uh, it was a great bike. The, um, I, I did tell him that the, the bottom bracket flexed a little bit too much, so we added a couple gussets on the front and the back and played with it a little bit and they made another bike. And So there were a couple made, a couple prototypes. And then I think the final was uh, we decided that it was just it, it was too, too flexible, so we ended up taking the top two the, the bottom tubes and put them into the bottom bracket. And then, because wrapping it underneath was just wasn't working. So I thought I saw a picture of me riding one that, where they went into the bottom bracket rather than underneath. And then shortly, maybe a month after that, I got hit, um, asked by Lynn Caston to be sponsored by Redline. So I finished my last race with the ABA, captured the ABA number one plate, and then I left SC and I went to go ride for Redline. So I took the uh, took the SC, I took the number one plate that I earned while on SC over to Redline. Um, before we talk any further about Redline, can you um, tell us your fondest memory of the SC bus trips? Well. BMX was starting to flourish in other states other than California. We'd made little trips to Arizona, uh, bounced to Oklahoma, uh, but never really gotten any further than that. So we decided that we were going to go to an East Coast tour. It was the NBA summer tour, I believe is what it was. And, and we were going to go as far back as Florida, um, New Jersey, New York and then just kind of zigzag back down across the country back to California. So Scott bought this old school bus. He uh, asked, uh, I don't know how much money it was for each rider if they wanted to go on this tour. Let's say it was uh, $300 and you can come on this tour and you know, you'll get your meals and you'll have places to sleep because we'll, we'll just do this bus thing. So we got all excited and we fabricated the bus, took out some seats, added some storage. I built this big gnarly roof rack system on the top, all welded all up myself, made it, um, loaded up all the bikes on top and all the luggage and then we just said, see you later people and off we went and we got, you know, we got out of Long Beach, you know, through Orange County, into Riverside County, got into San Bernardino County. We got out, we're going down the, I think it was the 40, Interstate 40, and I'm driving it, and we're all singing songs and just having a gay old time, and uh, all of a sudden I'm stepping on the gas pedal and the bus is just, it's not accelerating, so I'm like, I think the engine's way in the back, so I don't know when the stereo's playing and everyone's running around throwing shit at people, so I didn't know, but the, the motor blew up. So we were basically coasting, and luckily we're kind of coasting downhill, so it was kind of cool. <laughs> But the motor blew up and we ended up getting the, the bus towed to a, a one stop sign off the beaten path city called Ludlow. And that was what we ended up calling the Ludlow Triangle because they just kind of drew us in there. 
And I think we stayed there for three or four days, just uh, sleeping in the desert on top of the bus and telling stories and just having a good time. You know, it was like, it was like uh, just camping, it was fun. You know, a lot of, you know, bike riding around the parking lot. And then, but, we, but in the meantime, Scott's in the background you know, trying to get tow trucks, trying to get the bus here, trying to get fast, you know, does he need a new motor, is it, you know, so he's doing all this stuff, and us kids, we're just, you know, we're just having fun playing around, and, and Scott's like pulling his hair out, and he's just trying to figure out, what, you know, what we're going to do. Well, there was a race that I had to get to, and since I was the star rider, I needed, to, you know, he wanted to send me there, so he scraped up some money, and then I ended up jumping on a plane, and then flying back east, and going to the race while everyone stayed behind, while the bus got repaired. Um, the bus never really got repaired, so he had a big 15-passenger white, probably I think it was a Chevy van, could have been Ford, I don't remember, maybe it was Dodge, <laughs> it was a big van. Got it out, they made, uh, we made like plywood bunk beds, you know, that would sleep like 15 people, and they crammed all their bikes in there, threw luggage, bikes on the roof, and then they ended up, and they just took off and drove cross country like lickety split to you know to catch up with the rest of the tour. And then there was some antics on the way that they had on their own and I guess there's guys that can tell stories. But I do remember one of them was they were actually jamming down the road, they hit this bump and the, the bunk beds just all kind of collapsed on each other. You know? <laughs> it's like a poorly built high rise building that wasn't as quick proof. And it just crushed everybody. So I don't think I was part of that. I was already back east, so I didn't worry about it. But um, then the, the bus made it to New Jersey, and we hung out with Charlie Litsky and his family, and we were racing around New York City, chasing cabs, and just having a great time until three, four in the morning, just just being teenagers. And then uh, Scott's brother got the bus fixed, and then he's on the no, I couldn't say he was on the phone. So I don't think they had cell phones back then, but somehow. He, we were going west, he was coming east, and we just saw each other on the interstate, and we're like, yeah, the bus is back, you know, so we all pulled in and offloaded everything onto the bus, and, and then we got back in the bus, and, you know, the tour started. So how long was the tour? It seems like it was, like, an eternity, but I think it was more, I think it was like six weeks, if that, you know, I don't know, it could be long. Probably guys that are going to watch this and go, oh no, you started exactly on May 13th and you ended on February 1st, you know, I, I don't know. But it was long enough to get to know the other guys very yeah, well. Definitely. But then if you ask me who was on it, I'm going to tell you like three names. <laughs> um, moving on to Redline, so when they picked you up, um, they were already in full swing in production with cranks and frames. And, yeah. Um, who was the number one pro when you joined up? before you joined it? Well, I know that Greg Hill was on the team. And I think we picked up Chuck Rooner. My age is showing. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think there was any number one riders. Not in my not in my age group. You know, there'd probably been some of the younger kids that were, you know, in their age category, but top riders would have been myself and Greg. So how long after you joined them did um, Redline come up with a signature? Uh, I think it was fairly quick, probably within the first year. Um, I think it started off with, I think he already had the V-bars, but he just put my name on and, and they made, it became the Stu Thompson bars. Um, and then it was, he had so many different lines, I think there was like the 500, the 600, the MX2, the, I think there was a Carrera and there was PL20, and I don't know if the Carrera and the PL20 were the same. Um, some of these collectors will probably know more about the whole gamut of red lines, but I just remember that the bike had a five inch top tube, so I always remember that as being the, the PL20 or yeah PL20, you know the, the larger version. Um, the cranks the cranks were already being developed. I think before I even got there, Byron Friday was one of the instrumental 
brains behind getting the cranks and testing them and stuff. And at first they didn't have a pinch bolt, and then they came with a pinch bolt. And um, so Byron was very hands on and got all that stuff figured out before I got there. But you know, he wasn't on the team when I got there. Um, he, he went off and started driving for some other companies. Um, but the bike itself, I would say about a, I think it was probably about a year. Um, they started, you know, adding the, the, the brand name, you know, incorporating Stuart with the first two. Did you have um, custom frames, custom bars, cranks, or anything? You like know, that? he. It seemed like Lynn always wanted to have stock stuff. So if there weren't, uh, like if I told him I needed the bike a quarter inch longer, he would say, I don't think he, you know, you know well, let's make it this length because. You know, this kid has to ride it, and you're going to ride it, type thing. But I was big, and did we make the top tubes a little bit longer or drop the bottom brackets? I think I gave him that input. I can't remember if it actually came to intuition or not. It's just these are just times and everyday things. I just can't remember. <laughs> but I'm sure there was some input that I gave him. You know, had tube angles or steep tube angles or the bottom bracket felt too high or, or, or something. And there, there had to have been some interactions. It's just the way it was. I mean, you can't just make a bike perfectly, especially if he's not riding it, you know. So he has to have rider input to make things change. Um, how did your relationship change when you moved to Redline with Scott um, Bright Up? How did it change when you actually made a move? Um, I think he was bummed, but our relationship didn't really change. We were still friends. You know, wish me the best of luck, you know, like any any true you know, professional sponsor should or would do. Um, I don't think we had any. I personally don't remember any ill or feelings. Um, and then what led to you, uh, moving on to Huffy? Uh, I'd gotten another uh, title, number one title. I thought it might have been worth more than what Lynn was giving me, kind of asked him for a little bit of a higher, higher salary. Um, a good friend, Bob Hadley, was, um, had gotten asked to work with Huffy and become the team manager to create a team for the Huffy brand. And he asked, he, he had this idea that he thought that he could pull me over to Huffy to help make this bike brand. And we had about a six year or five year plans what we wanted to do. We wanted to start by creating a brand of bike that may not be suitable for your factory team racer, but would suit a kid who may never ever race. You know, in the United States it's very sparse and to say there was a kid in Iowa, his dad worked on a farm and he got up early in the morning to feed the chicks and the chickens or pick the corn and whatnot. He may never, ever, ever race the BMX bike. But he goes down to the local store, he sees the magazines, he sees his bike. He says, Dad, Dad, I want this bike. But, you know, I can't, I need to feed the chickens, I can't spend $300 on a bike. But, you know, they go to the local Kmart or the Walmart and they see this bike that's, you know, suited up and looks exactly like it. Hanging from the handlebars is a free membership for BMX action, free 30-day trial for ABA BMX to get them involved in BMX. And the second stage of, of the program would have been to come out with a fully customized bike shop, full pro bike made for serious racers. The team fell apart after our original um, team manager, not Bob, Bob Hadley, but the, the guy who was the, behind it, he, he left the company. And when he left the company, another guy took in and just kind of didn't run it right, and the team ended up dissolving, and it fell apart. So the second half of our plan never, never materialized. So that's that that that's kind of a bummer because people, you know, that's I don't want to say it's a dark spot in my history of BMX, but it helped me bring other kids that never would have got into BMX into BMX by producing this this mass market bike to let them emulate. What, what I did or what they saw other pictures of pro riders or amateur riders in the magazines. They can do this with this bike and not break the bank. 
So did you actually race those bugs? No, we had, we, Huffy gave us uh, the green light to manufacture our own bikes per our own specs. And so I worked with um, the, the frame manufacturing guys in Dayton, Ohio, but the, the turnaround for them to make a bike and then ship it to me because they were also working with um, Huffy was the frame producer for the 1984 um, Olympics that were in LA and they just didn't have the, the time manpower to pull, a guy, pull, a, pull one of their engineers away and the welder and make this bike so they said hey Stu, Bob, go ahead and find a local frame manufacturing company in your neck of the woods and build whatever you want you know we'll just pay for it so you know the biggest company at the time in Southern California that made frames was GT Bicycles so we went and talked to Gary Turner and he said yeah you know you just tell me what you want and, and we'll, we'll put a little uh, cubicle away in the side of the shop and, and you know, give us the dimensions and we'll make whatever you want so they made some custom bikes for us or for me Gary Ellis uh, was on the team at the time Mikey King um, some of those guys, uh, I won't say who, they just kind of maybe re-stickered another, another popular bike that they were comf you know, comfortable riding with, but, but Hopley didn't really have a problem with that because they didn't, we hadn't had a custom bike yet. You know, they were working on it, so we didn't have anything, so they didn't have a problem with it. But I myself rode a, a one-off custom bike that was designed for myself. Um, so from there, is it when you created your own family bike shop? Business? Yeah, I, you know, I kind of squirreled away uh, some money through the winnings throughout my career. I had a, a wonderful, beautiful wife who was very financially, a uh, good financial planner. So she squirreled away some money and then we decided that it might be fun to open a bike shop. So I would say probably in 86, 87, we started thinking about opening a bike shop. So. We got enough money and got a, a couple of suppliers, what I was going to carry, got lines of credit going with the bank and we decided to pull the trigger and so we, we opened a bike shop and um, it's just a family shop, I call it Sue Thompson's Family Bicycle Center, did a lot of repairs, didn't sell a lot of bikes, but uh, had fun, it was my passion. You know. and I ran that for about six, seven, maybe, yeah, it's about seven years, very competitive bike shop. Um, in the area, there was like six or seven bike shops within a five mile radius. A couple guys owned two shops, so their buying powers were higher. So it was hard for me to be, keep the same price point as them. Couldn't carry the same kind of bikes. There was a lot of territorial issues with bike brands. So I just, you know, I, I you know, I repaired bikes. I sold skateboards and scooters, and you know, I just had a fun time at it. And, and then just, you know, and then after a while, it was like, yes, yeah, it's pretty hard, you know, I don't have a whole lot of family time, I'm always working, worrying about insurances and paying bills, and we decided that it was probably our best interest to fold it, sell it, and, and move on with our lives and figure out something new. Um, so you had a long racing career, you were fairly old in comparison to a lot of the other pros at the time when you quit. What, what actually kept you motivated all those years? I was still winning. I mean, that's about the only motivation you need. Um, I think there were early, earlier tabloids, you know, when I was being interviewed and I was probably 16 or 17 and, you know, some young cocky kid and said, yeah, I'm going to race for a couple more years and I'm going to get into motocross and, you know, I'll probably retire when I'm 18 and, you know, that never happened, you know, I was 18 and 19 and 20 and then I think I, I, I had a, my own personal goal was to make it to 30. Um, I had a couple injuries that kept sidelining me towards the end of my career. I had a broken collarbone that wasn't healing. I kept falling on it and keep re-injuring it, re-breaking it. Um, and it just, it was, it was, I'd get right back up to top three finishes and then I'd fall on my shoulder and I would hurt it. I have to take three, four weeks off. And meanwhile, all the races are going, my points are going down and falling back down. I get back up to shape, I get back up the top three finishes, and I crash on my shoulder, re-injure it. So it's just a vicious cycle, and my body was starting to hurt. And I just, I was getting beat. Um, the, young, the young guns were coming up. You know, it was, it was time to pass the torch and move on. Did you get to 30? I think I made it to like uh, 29 and a half-ish. 
you know, I got close. I got close, real close. Um, what was it that um, made you decide to join the police force in here? Well, I had, uh, I probably had about three odd jobs between the time that I sold, sold my bike shop, which would have been in, let's see, 90, 90, 91, I think I may have sold the bike shop. So I did some sales jobs at a, a, a large, um, today they call them like Costco or Sam's Clubs, but before that they weren't, they weren't those, those stores, but it was a similar store I sold. I would go around to businesses and sell, because they're a membership store, so I'd go around and try to sell the memberships to get the businesses to come in so they could buy the products and save money. So I did that for man, well, maybe six months to eight months. And um, then I worked at a, um, it's called a Family Fitness, which is a fitness store, workout place. And I sold um, memberships, you know, to come in and work out. I got commissions off that, but it was like, um, I'm not a salesman. So and I just kind of worked out there, you know, Got stronger and got better, and then all this meantime, I'm still, you know, I'm still racing mountain bikes and I'm riding road bikes, and because I'm a cyclist and that's all I want to do, I just want to ride bikes until the day they put me in the grave. <laughs> so uh, I'm like, God, you know, I, I need a, I need a better job. I just need something. So um, where I was living, my neighbor worked for a police department. And you know, I'd be in the backyard pulling weeds, and I could hear him and all his cop buddies talking, telling stories, laughing, and having a good time. And I'd peer over the fence and, hey, John, what's going on? What's happening? Oh, Steve, come on over. You know, so they invited me over, and I would, you know, chit chat with them and stuff. And then um, I, I started to work with uh, one of my bike shop rivalries and kind of helped um, spearheaded their BMX department within the store. And even when I had my own shop, uh, but at the other guy's shop, Riverside Cyclery, the Riverside Police Department would bring their bikes in for service. And so the cops would bring their bikes in and I'd talk to them about biking and, you know, what do you guys do? Do you run downstairs and you jump off curbs? And they're like, oh, we don't do that. We just kind of ride around, <laughs> ride around in crowds. And I said, really? You know, so I'm fixing the bikes and talking to these guys. And then um, one of my wife's girlfriend's husband, you know, we were chit-chatting and he was like, yeah, I was thinking about, you know, going down and maybe thinking about, you know, joining the police force. And I'm like, yeah, hey, my neighbor's a cop. And, you know, we, I just kind of, just kind of got drawn into the whole thing. It was kind of cool. And then I said, well, why don't you come with me and uh, I'm going to go test and take the test and we'll see what happens. You know, I'm like, yeah, okay. So I go down there and I'm like, well, crap, if I'm going to go down there, I might as well take the test too, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not just going to you know, hold your hand while you take it. So I ended up taking the test myself, and the um, funny thing is that I passed and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and then after that I shaved my head and went to the academy and I was getting yelled at, and but I was 35 years old. I mean, I'm, all these guys that are yelling and screaming at me, they're younger than me. You know, I'm like, okay, bring it, because I know the game, you know, they just, intimidation factor, you know, so I just, I just bit my tongue and went through it, did the best I could. I was actually one of the strongest, I was the oldest guy in my class, and yet I was also the strongest, fastest, and, you know, in all the obstacle courses and stuff like that, so they were all like, um, and then of course, one of the, our tactical staff guys, you know, they research who, you know, who everybody is, and, so he found out that I was some big, you know, ex BMX racer dude. So he was always giving me a hard time. <laughs> so after we graduated, and we can actually, you know, pal out with these guys because you don't want to during the academy because you know, they're mean to you. We went on runs, and, and I, you know, since he punished me so much in the academy, I took him out for a bike ride and crushed him. <laughs> Um, let's move on to uh, BMXing today. What do you think of modern BMX bikes and how they differ to... Uh, I mean, they're not much difference. 20 inch wheels, cranks, pedals, chains, handlebars. I mean, the big, the big thing is uh, they're, 
They're probably a little bit longer, more stretched out than the bikes we had. Um, I'm not sure why they even have seats nowadays, but they slam their seats all the way down. But then they always say, well, how did you ride your seat so high? Well, you know, you guys are clipped in, you don't put your feet out. We, you know, use the seat on the inside of our thighs to balance ourselves because we took our foot off and went around corners because we didn't have these massive concrete bowl turns to like velodrome stuff. You know, you actually had to, you know, hit your brakes and slow down. So, I mean, that's, that's the big thing. It's just, you know, they get catapulted off these big hills to pick up speed where, you know, our starting hill was maybe, you know, half a meter high and you know you had to pedal um, and then the jumps weren't as big of course so we you know we just did more pedaling you know you, nowadays you you come out of the ramp and before you get the first jump you're already going you know 30k or plus so it's like 30 miles an hour or however you <laughs> wants to watch this metric or miles per hour you can do the conversion I can't <laughs> What about the uh, differences between the tracks? Like um, when you first started racing, it would have been fairly flat, like you said. Yeah, they're, 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 they're fairly flat, no giant construction equipment making it. <laughs> um, basically, kids with shovels and pails and wheelbarrows making the tracks. You know, some of the old, some of, you know, some of the newer tracks, yeah, obviously we rented, you know, backhoes and stuff. I remember myself running the backhoe at the Corona track all the time, building up jumps and making straightaways and stuff so there's video or still pictures of me driving the tractor at Corona um, you know hands on but you know the new tracks are just they're really groomed um, yeah there's there's still jumping and stuff but that's more of the elite level for the most part I mean those back tires stay on the ground a lot on these tracks <laughs> nowadays and I'm just old school I like to jump yep. um, what are your thoughts on BMX in the Olympics I, you know, I wish it the best of luck. I just don't know how long it's going to stay in the Olympics. I was almost surprised that it was that it came back the second time, and even the third time. But I, you know, don't be mad at me. I just, I just think that something else will will take its place. Because when they put a new sport in, something gets bumped out. But the Olympics back when I was racing, we, you know, people would always ask me, "Do you think you'll ever be in the Olympics?" Well. Back in my heyday, there were no professionals allowed in the Olympics. The Olympics was an amateur sport, and since I was paid professional, there was no way I was going to be in the Olympics. It's changed, you know, since since that time frame. You know, now they have professional athletes are in the Olympics now. So, I mean, I hope it stays in. It'd be great for the sport, uh, but in, I think the Olympics are also involving in, into more of extreme sports too. You know. Synchronized swimming still, I guess, I guess at this point. No offense for synchronized swimming. Um, but I mean, you know, uh, the 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 Olympics for the new millennial is is extreme, more extreme sports. I, mean, I, I think they're bringing freestyle in yeah. now. You know, so I don't know how they're going to judge it, but I mean, more power. I mean, that's great. It's 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 a boost for the sport, no matter what. You know, because people see that. But, you know, the little 12 year old kid, they're watching the Olympics with these pro guys coming down these, I don't know how high these hills are. Eight I mean, meters. Eight meters, that's freaking hard. That way up there, and they have these explosive crashes and body parts flying and bikes busting, and, and you know, parents watching this, and, you, and they're like, uh, you're not racing BMX, <laughs> because that's what they see it as, you know. They, they just need to be, the, the local track scene needs to come back. It's, it seems like we're losing a lot of local tracks. Um, what advice would you give to today's up and coming riders that are looking to race as a professional BMX? I think the thing is, um, if you can't train yourself, find a trainer. Um, find somebody who's been through it and done it. A lot of times, you know, dads yelling pedal, 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 and pull up and stay down, but have never ridden a bike themselves, have no idea. Um, but I would say these, the, I'll, say I'm, I'll be 60 next year, so we're probably looking at 
almost three generations of families that are probably out on the track. You know, because my, my son's almost 30. He could have had a kid. My son could have raised. His kid could be racing. So there could be three generations of families out there. So dad yelling, pedal, 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 or you need to pull, has some legitimacy to it because he could have done it himself. But, you know, read some books. Um, do your research on exercises specific to BMX, you know, with muscle groups, sprinting, and so forth, um, and just do the best you can. Um, you're going to know if you're going to be a competitive rider pretty much pretty quick. If, you know, there's, there's those people that are just talented and, and will exceed, and there's those that are just going to be moto filler. Um, you need to figure out who you are and then go from there. Um, stay motivated. Don't be discouraged. Don't tell. Don't let other people bring you down. Stay positive, um, and and keep your head straight. Um, treat others like you'd want to be treated. Don't be a dork or I don't want to say dick, but I don't know if I should say that. But, you know, just be true to yourself and and enjoy the sport and have fun at it. You know, that's the whole thing, is have fun at it. Yeah. Hope that didn't sound too corny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you plan to race anytime in the near future? I always want to. Um, obviously, I've got a 60th birthday coming up next year. Um, one of my plans is obviously to be racing. Um, I kind of banged up my shoulder uh, last month on a mountain bike race. Or preparing for a mountain bike race. I was on a training ride. I crashed. Uh, banged up my shoulder, so I have to let that heal. And I just realized that I'm just not as young as I used to, and I'm, it's taking longer to heal. Uh, so I have to be patient. And I might miss a race. I did have plans to, to do a race or, uh, later on this year, but I think I'm just going to scrap that. And, and maybe in uh, 2018, look at the calendar and, and see where it flies. I usually want to go to local races around my community, uh, so I have to find out what next year's national schedule is, and I'll go from there. But yeah, I'd, I'm going to make an appearance somewhere. It's just it's in my nature. I have to. It's me. Um, recently, like in the last few years, we've seen you uh, rejoin SC. Um, yes. Uh, how did that come about? I, uh, I mean, no disrespect to Redline. They helped me out after I quit racing. They supplied me with bikes. A lot of, a lot of the races that I did between the time of retirement to up to a couple of years ago, I was always riding a Redline bike because I like to represent the bikes and I like to represent the companies that um, did me well. And you know, the name recognition is out there for both Redline and for Stu Thompson, and I think. You know, keeping the two together was a good thing, uh, but they changed hands a lot. Um, the original uh, CEO or president, uh, Chuck Cooper, left the company. It changed hands, got sold. Um, just a lot of stuff got lost. Um, didn't know who to call. Didn't, you know, just just felt weird. Um, and then with um, the 40-year anniversary of SC Racing coming up. Todd had these really cool plans, pulled me aside, asked me if I'd like to get involved with it. And I said, yeah, you know, it sounds, sounds cool, let's, let's, let's do it, you know. So we kind of had a gentleman's handshake and um, we, he started uh, getting the bikes ready for, because he starts, he starts working on bikes that, it, that won't come out in two years. You know? So right, right now he's in China working on, I think, the. 20, I think he's actually working on the 2018, maybe 2019 branding. So he's, he looks way, he's visionary, he looks way out there. So we had a game plan on what we wanted to do and so far we're two years into it and it's, it's looking great. So it's fun. I mean, I like associating with SC because SC is just so old school and so traditional and, um, you know, they're not super mainstream like with, you know, all these other fancy companies, but it's still SC and it's what BMX, I think, is, um, what is it, it's like, it's, I mean, you just, you think of BMX, you think of SC racing, 
you know, and he's just he's just brought back all those old school BMX racers that were 12 and 13 years old that you know had a PK Ripper or Ju6 or a Flow Flyer or something that now they're 45 going on 50. Their kids are riding racing. You know, I want to ride, but I don't want. You know, my knees don't handle a 20-inch bike. I want a big bike. So he's just he's reinventing the market, or has reinvented the market. And there's so many other companies that are jumping, jumping on the bandwagon too. So I, I think mean, Todd was an innovator in getting the retro bike lines going, and bigger wheels for us, you know, less older, older guys. How did you find the um, the 29er? Stu Thompson STR. You know, it's it's a it's a cool bike. Um, he he brought me on a little bit in the middle of uh, him already um, making the dimensional designs of the bike. So he designed it up after a bike that he'd already ridden. So when I came aboard and then the bike came out, I rode it and I'm like, uh, Todd, I wish it would have been a little bit longer. You know, you're, you're, you know, the, when you turn, if you if you ride, a lot of people ride. In the middle of their arch, and so your toes will stick out. Well, if you got big feet, and if you're pedaling and turning at the same time, there's a chance that you can hit the, the wheel with your foot. But you know, just right on the ball of your foot, and and when you turn, don't put that pedal out front. You'll be <laughs> fine. Uh, but the bike rides fun. It's a nice bike. It's very, it's very user friendly. You know, big wheels rolls over the rocks and off the curbs, and wheelie's really nice. Um, it's just a fun bike to ride. You know. You know, it's just a, uh, it's like uh, taking a small sponge, you drop it in the water and it's just swelled up. It's just a, a big version of the STR1. What do you currently have as race bikes? I currently have the, tw it's the SE Double XL Flowable Flyer. It's their race version. It's 20, 24 inch. Um, don't really play much in the 20 inch because I, I almost, I'll put it beneath me to have to ride intermediate, and I just don't have enough time and power and mindset to ride 46 and over expert. Mm -hmm. you know, the guys are just way too fast, and I just I don't want to hurt myself. So I stay off the 20 inch bike. I ride the 24. I ride my age group. I think it's 55 to 60 year olds, and I have a good time. You know, there's there are some good fast guys in that group. You know, they ride and practice all the time, and I just show up out of the blue about every three years and <laughs> throw the mix in there. It's good. I like it. Um, let's talk about Australia a little bit. You've got a bit of history here. Uh, what do you remember most about the um, USA versus? Well, I, I remember coming in. Uh, we were riding for Redline. Um, Lynn Cassin had pick up a distributor. Uh, Blair Shepard was his name. I think he was out of Brisbane. Can't be 100% sure. So we, we flew over. Uh, I don't think we flew into to Sydney. Uh, we got off the plane. There was already uh, some photographer from a newspaper already asking questions. Want to take photographs? So we're like we're at the arrivals counter at the curb. And we're building our bikes, we're putting on our uniforms, and we're like bunny hopping. And that's all we can do. And it made like the front cover of the, of the newspaper that, that next day. So that was kind of cool. So that was like, wow, super starving here, you know. So we, um, we traveled uh, back to Brisbane, we went up to Gold Coast, hit some local tracks, came back to Sydney, Melbourne. I think we, I don't know if we went to Adelaide or not, but we flew over to Perth. Um, and just kind of did a tour, you know, of all the local tracks in Australia and just had a great time meeting all the young BMXers and, and racing the local fast guys and just having a great, great time. You know, we brought a couple other uh, Americans over, Seth Buscheri, Danny Davidow, John Cruz, a couple other guys, sorry if I forgot your names. Um, but, you know, it was, it was the U.S. guys, you know, and then against the, you know, the Aussie pros or the past guys. It was fun. It was a good time. And then I think I came back the year following, but my tour was concentrated in New Zealand. 
and we did the, the New Zealand tour over there and I think I flew into Sydney for just a little bit and then and back out. I don't, think it's, I, don't, I don't remember spending a lot of time on my second trip in Australia. Did you um, travel the same way to other countries at, at the same time? Uh, we also did Japan. Um, we went, when we had, uh, I think it was Sun Tour, was, was sponsored with Redline. We went over to the Sun Tour factory and toured that. Sound bikes were made, and products and stuff like that. And that was that was a, I think that was a, a one or two week tour. Uh, took a bunch of U.S. guys over, and it was more of a PR thing, you know, just introducing BMX to, you know, what was it Land of the Sun? Japan. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we did other countries. We did, uh, we went to Paris, France, but that was after my red line. My, what well, was that? <laughs> yeah, no, I was on Huffy uh, when I went to Paris, did the Bercy race. Uh, I won that, and then I came back the next year, but I didn't have a sponsor, so I, uh, MBK, the year, uh, the, the French team, um, brought me over, and I rode their jersey, and then uh, my performance kind of lacked. I didn't do very good, but I still had a good time. Um, you know, been to Venezuela, Lynn sent myself and John Anderson to Africa for a little tour. Um, Holland, Germany, just you know, just rock star status. It was awesome. Um, what brought you back to Australia this time around? Um, I got a call from uh, Glenn Ballinger, um, want to know if I'd be involved in uh, kind of an old school collector's reunion thing. I guess it, it, I'm, I'm blown away with the quality of, of um, bikes restored from as far back as the, the mid-70s. Um, and I didn't realize how big it was until I got here and I was like, Five, six hundred bikes that are just restored to pristine conditions. Some of them were like super, super show shine. <laughs> you know. um, but uh, he just asked me if I could come over, and because they knew that I came over here and there was such a good fan base from when I came over, and all these people um, were, you know, big SC bike collectors for one thing, or they knew me more <clears throat> as, a, as a red line rider. And uh, I said, well, if I come over, I know that when I came over, I was on red line, so people have that memory. But you know, if I come over, I'm probably going to be representing SC Racing. But I came over here, and I was like, there's a lot of SC Racing stuff, <laughs> you know, a lot of collectors. So um, he asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll come over. It's not a problem. No worries. We'll do it. So here I am. So how was the reception in Sydney? Um, you said a lot of bikes, but. Um Obviously, a lot of autographs as well. Yeah, and as soon as I got there, big line at my table. You know, kind of got out of control. <laughs> but it was—it's humbling. Uh, you know, I took the time to sign everything I could, pose for pictures, talk to people, handshakes. I mean, if it wasn't for the fan base that I had, I don't think I'd be the person I am today. You know, I got to attribute a, a lot of my success to the fans because they—they. They, motivate me and you know write fan letters and, and shake hands and, and ask for autographs and, and that's that's special to me because you know you can't treat people like crap you know I mean because otherwise you'll just be some knucklehead you know and I don't want to be that guy I, I, I'm personable I like people I like talking to people um, and I'm just glad I was we were all in that same era that we grew up together and me as a racer and them as a fan or, or a young racer and it's humbling to know that I'm still known today as that that young guy with the goldy locks that I cut all off. <laughs> um, what do you see as the biggest difference between the US and Australia? In regards to just well, uh, like general beer? Life. Or oh, it could be beer. <laughs> speak. Um, <laughs> You know, while I haven't been to the racetrack yet, so I can't really compare it racing-wise. And I don't, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time racing, going to local tracks in my states either. So, you know, I'll get, a, I'll get, a, I'll get a good glance at it tomorrow. 
um, how the race scene is, you know, how big the moto counts are and stuff like that. It may be bigger just because, you know, I'm there, I don't know. Um, hopefully it's the same size when I'm not there. Um, because that's the draw, is the local track scene in, in, in the States is, is dropping. Uh, we're losing tracks. Um, I don't know if it's because, you know, it could be because we need more than one bicycle association. I think there has to, there has to be some competition. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into politics. But it wouldn't hurt to have another organization to have some competition. Yeah. Um, so racing-wise, I don't know yet. I won't know until tomorrow is the town it is. But I think there's still the same enthusiasm for the collectors and the restorers, whether it's you know, new old stock or it's uh, repop stuff. Um, it's still bringing the bike back to its luster. Who cares if the sticker's not the original one? It looks like it to me. I couldn't tell, you know. Um, it's just nice to see the bikes restored. I like to see them a little muddy and dirty. I mean, you know, like road hard and put away wet. Yeah, but, you know, to each his own. But it's nice to see the bikes. You know, it's so cool to walk around and, and you know, I remember that bike and I remember that bike and I don't remember that bike, but it looks good. and. Um, there's just a lot out there. I didn't really realize that there were so many independent little bikes out there, but there's tons. But it's cool to see it, and, and, it, it, and, and the enthusiasm is there. I see it in, in the States, too. In fact, when I was here, I got a text message from Craig Turner, Gary Turner's son. There, he has a kind of like a every three, four months, he has like a little impromptu bike show swap meet type thing and he's got another one coming up uh, in October 7th he wants me to come out and be a judge again so um, I'll have to look at my calendar see if I'm working or not I don't know yet but that, that's fun you know it's a little more low-key it's not as big um, but you know it's fun it's still fun to see what everybody has I think I think judging wise is a little bit different here a lot of these bikes you know if you try to jump on it and pedal, the bars might move, or the you know, the wheels aren't really tight because they're afraid they might squeeze into the paint on the chain stays and stuff like that. But the bikes that we judge in California at the shows, you know, everything's got to be tight, everything has to be working. I have to be able to, if I needed to jump on the bike and, and ride it around the pits, it has to be roadworthy. Um, not so much um, just a pristine showpiece. They're, they're looking more for authenticity. Can it be ridden? Is it, is it road worthy? Yeah. But there are some that are just super clean, just like everybody else's, because everybody likes to go above and beyond to make these bikes pretty. Have you been inspired to um, maybe develop one of your own bikes? No. no. <laughs> no. Um, I don't have the time, patience to hunt down and look for. Um, you know, as a factory racer in the heyday, you know, Lynn gives me a new bike, I give the old one back. Um, I get a new pair of handlebars, I give the old handlebars back. I break the pair of handlebars, I get a new pair of handlebars. Um, I never really had whole complete bikes to, to keep. And a lot of times, you know, Lynn or Scott or whoever I rode for would, you know, would want the bike back. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a paid athlete for them, you know. I'm, um, I'm there to, to test the product and, you know, when I'm done, I mean, I'm just a contracted rider to be, you know, put it fairly. So I give the stuff back. I didn't really keep and hoard stuff. And, you know, you go, you go to a race and you get to the finish line and you get mobbed. I can have your pack, can I have your handlebars, can I earn a helmet, can I have your number plate, can I have your grips, can I have your helmet, can I give me your jersey, you know, and, you know, stuff just comes flying off and you give stuff away. And, and usually when I was at the races, I would, I don't know, I would strike up a conversation with a kid or see somebody and um, intermingle with their parents or something and then I would, you know, sometime during the day I would say, you know, you know, after this race is over, you know, would you like, you know, my jersey or something like that. And I would, you know, I'd give jerseys away left and right, you know, it's just, it's what you do. Um, but, you know, the hardware stuff, like the helmets, those are kind of personal. I would keep, I would, you know, keep those a lot. And the bikes I wouldn't give away, but I'd have to give them back. Just one more question. Just um, uh, probably, what's your best memory of this current trip so far, and 
Um, what are you looking forward to? Um, I'm looking forward to a smooth, restful plane flight home. <laughs> um, 15 hours. I hope the plane doesn't run out of gas. Um, when I stayed with um, Mick Smits in Sydney, um, he was the promoter of the BMX Expo 2017 this year. I think he's done three more prior, or maybe more. Um, seeing the, the hard work and the dedication that goes into putting this whole program together is just, it's mind boggling, you know. Him sacrificing time away from his family, you know, his wife, his two kids, um, and then taking on um, a visitor, putting him up in his house for three or four days, and, you know, taking Tom off from his job to promote a, a passion that he likes. You know. So you know, hats off to the, the people that promote these shows because it's, it's really time consuming and it's a labor of love. Um, the, um, the friendship, the happiness, the camaraderie, um, the, the people of Australia are just so far to me, they've been super friendly, super nice, you know, Everybody's cheers, everybody's thanks me, you know, it's just everybody's helping, everybody's opening doors, nobody's being really rude, you know, no one's cutting anybody off in traffic, everybody's smiling, and it's like a happy place, you know, I feel like I'm in Disneyland or something, you know. <laughs> but you know, it's it's an honor to, to be invited and be treated as, as a special guest. And, and I thank all the people and all the all the people that were involved getting me over here, I thank them. It's, it, it really is a, um, a memory that I'll cherish. And I've made friends, reunited with old friends, and then maybe sometime I can come back on holiday <laughs> rather than not, not bike related. <laughs> all right, um, that's it. That's all the questions I've got. Thank you very much for giving us some of your time. Thanks, Mike. Um, and safe flight home. Will do. <laughs> Peace out. You sleep over there, Danny? Oh, <laughs>